It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to Science on Top. This is episode 196 for Sunday the 9th of August 2015. I'm your host Ed Brown and I'm joined by microbiologist Dr Shane Joseph. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. Alright Shane, let's start off with a story that goes back to May the 22nd, 2011. That's when an EF5 category tornado, which just means winds in excess of 320 kilometres an hour, struck the small town of Joplin in Missouri. It killed 158 people. But in the weeks after the tornado, the doctors started to notice something very strange among some of the people who were injured. Shane, it's time to talk. Flesh-eating fungus, isn't it? Yeah. Apophysomyces trapeziformis. Can we just call um, it Apophis from now on? Yes. <laughs> like we'll just call it the fungus. Fine. Um, right. It's a... It's a member of the, a group of fungi called the zygomycetes, and that just refers to the way it reproduces. Not really important. What is important is the fact that it doesn't normally infect people. Um, it's a plant eater; like it just eats it, it, it eats dead plant material. Um, doesn't normally cause infections in humans, but apparently the only reason it doesn't do that is because it can't penetrate the skin barrier. In the case of these people, um, it looks like the winds from the tornadoes basically forced these spores into their already open wounds. Oh. Yeah. Like and, and bullet wounds kind of thing, like just pushing it into the skin. Well, yeah, I mean, well, it's, it's sort of in, like apparently it, the people who got these, um, the 13 people who were infected by this fungus were sort of right in the middle of the worst hit part of the town. So, so as, had, if, as if their day wasn't sh- enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. And I was thinking that, oh my God. Okay. <laughs> what else can go wrong? Ru- oh God, flesh-eating fungus. Yeah. So, um, can you imagine that? People are like, oh, my house burned down. Oh, you've been well, infected with flesh-eating. Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> Seriously? And, 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 and to be honest, five people died from this too. It wasn't even like the third, of the 30 yeah. people who were infected, five people died from the fungus. So, yeah, this wow. relatively harmless but. Fungus, as soon as it gets into your bloodstream, can cause horrible things. And the weird thing is that it sort of it doesn't seem to be affected by your immune system. It's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'm a fungus. I don't well, care. Well, <laughs> like the immune system's never seen this sort of. I thing guess before, so. I imagine, yeah, unless... I guess so. And it's and what's really cool about I mean, I, I'm a microbiologist, so I think this is really damn cool. Um, these things grow really, really fast. Apparently, they're called lid lifters because they literally lift the lids of the petri dishes they're grown on <laughs> within what? a matter of hours, and they sort of overflow. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of cool. freaky. It's kind of cool. I mean, like, it's not cool that it kills people, but it's, you know. No, well, <laughs> if, you, if it does that in a Petri dish, imagine what it's going to do if it gets into a small cut or, well, or even creates yeah. a wound by being Yeah, well, but the, well, the thing is, it, it, it can't out. create the wounds here. I mean, basically, it was blown into, like, when I said before, well, the, the 13 people who were affected by um, the tornado the most would have had the most wounds and lacerations from flying debris, and so oh. it just got blown into there. So we don't think that, like, you know, they were standing there and 320 kilometer an hour, a piece of fungus went no. directly into their body and tore their skin open. No, no, no. It's more That's just a, somewhat less cool, but still. <laughs> well, you know, it's just it's just a weird sort of. <laughs> you just happen to have a cut or some sort of a wound, yeah. and then that yeah. gets blown in. Wow. Um, I, imagine, I mean, you know, and, and it's cut. still a fairly small sample size, so it's very hard to track the sort of epidemiology of this, really. Because yeah. it's like, you know, but they have, and they've figured out that okay, well, this is where the worst hit people were. They were the ones who got the infections. Um, what they, what was interesting is they didn't find any of um, that strain of um, the fungus in the area, so it's blown in from somewhere else or somewhere around. Not in, not three hundred and twenty kilometers an hour. It wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I think it shows that when these disasters strike, we we see the superficial kind of, uh, yes, houses flattened and everything yeah, so mess. superficial. Well, <laughs> but, but we see just the, the one obvious, side of you it. Mean. Yeah. But there is this added component of flow-on effects that can happen, whether it be fire or infectious flesh-eating fungus or whatever. Mm, yes. Yeah. 
It's just and so there's many all sorts of waterborne diseases, all yeah. that sort of stuff, depending on what yeah. you know sort of country it happens in. Yeah, exactly. And this, I mean, again, it was only a, a it was a relatively small number of people who um, right. were affected by it. I mean, you know, 158 people died from the actual tornado. A, th- a, th- a further five people died from the actions of this fungus. So we're not talking. Oh my god, this is a horrible epidemic that followed in the wake of this horrible sure. disaster. But it is. It's, it's. It's not. I don't think it's something that any health agencies would have expected to happen. <laughs> for a start no and you know and, and as tragic as it is it's also quite fascinating so is is there a antifungal that we know that works on it or something I am not sure I think the, well the problem is that because I would you necessarily think, have stocks of that if from, it's well, not known in your area and well the other thing is that I don't think yeah I mean they, they, could, they could probably use a broad spectrum mm. antifungal and I'm talking just purely off the top of my head here um, but the other thing is I don't think because as, because apophysomyces is not a human pathogen per se, why would you have a medication for it, really? One, yeah. that, one that you can take as, you know, I'm sure they've got antifungals that are used for cropping and stuff like that, but you wouldn't want to use those on a human. Well, this has only ever so, affected, what was it, 75 people or something? Something like that, yeah. So it's yeah. obviously not going to be studied very well no, no. compared to all the other funguses and things, but, no. or fungi even. It just, it, but it also shows that, uh, it also brings back home to me this, this message that we know very little about the natural world. We know we know less than we think we do. And when something like this happens, you like people are like, oh, this plant eating fungus can cause this in a human. Oh, okay, that's I'm interested now. And then, yeah, yeah. Well, that's I think going to be a bit of a theme of uh, today's show because <laughs> it's uh, the natural world is scarier than we thought. Yeah. I did actually, when I was reading these stories on the couch, I, I, I was sort of sitting there, my mind boggling, and I said to my wife, nature is messed up, seriously, <laughs> what the hell? Yeah, no, true. And speaking of fungi, we do know that a large number of the world's frogs are at risk of extinction because of a fungus, but there were two interesting papers published in separate journals last week. One detailed a brand new tree frog species, and the other, perhaps more interesting one, discovering the venomous headbutting of two known species of frogs. Uh, Lucas, they found out about the venomous headbutting the hard way, didn't they? <laughs> this is um, really sacrificing everything in the name of science. Well, yeah, so the, the researcher found out, out that one basically from, from handling one of these frogs. He, he picked out one of these things and, and apparently it, you know, it started trying to escape i imagine and uh and he described it as though it was it was thrashing about as if trying to headbutt his hand um mm. and and you said it looked just felt like being hit by uh, sort of rough sandpaper didn't really think much of it and and the reason is these these frogs have got these sort of these spiny spikes at the front of their of their face and and uh, <laughs> there's some the photos on um, on both of the, or a few of the links that you sent through that are, that show um, skulls of these frogs with all the flesh removed, and you can see these quite pronounced spikes. And there's there's um, two of the species have got you know slightly different you know spikes. They're not quite as long on one of them, but um, but yeah, these spikes allowed the the frogs um, um, you know Venom. this toxin that's that's produced by the frog to actually be injected, if you like, into into the researcher's hand. So about five hours later, apparently this developed into intense pain and it sort of radiated up his arm. I'm sorry, I got that wrong. It wasn't five yeah. hours later. It was for five hours that it yeah. lasted. Oh, my intense, God. Intense pain. And apparently it was, yeah, it was quite soon afterwards. And, uh, and, and he, it's in the middle of the jungle. Yeah, about four near hours any... away from any city. Oh, so he just God. had to put up with it. And, and he said he, it, apparently it didn't initially connect you know the dots and realize that this pain yeah. had come from you know handling the frog well, why which makes you? me wonder what I else mean... he was doing <laughs> <laughs> so, no, i mean but, it's, but, the, but you know why would you immediately you know because as we know as far as we knew that there weren't frogs that could do this so why would you even connect the well, two well sure dots? but i mean <laughs> uh, many <laughs> many frogs are known to be toxic in fact these frogs were known to be toxic these are not new species of frog they've been known uh, these were described back in you know sort of late 1800s 1896 or something so you know it's not it's not a new frog so i don't know i, th- I would have thought you know maybe Maybe I'm being a bit harsh. I, well, I just no, think- presumably they also handled a number of other frogs or anything, and this you'd expect it to be um, poisonous, 
in that if you were to eat it, eat it, it would uh, yeah. cause or all just, sorts or of Or lick it, or but in any way sort of partake in any yes. sort of... Yeah, if, if it gets it inside you. your mucous membrane, basically. But, but, not but your, they don't have any ways yeah, of injecting it, as far as we knew. No. Well, so that's, that's, that's thing, why though. you wouldn't make the uh, obvious connection, because how's it. a frog so going to inject it? You know, it's, it's, they've got in on a technicality here. So frogs, <laughs> there, are no, there are no known... <laughs> <laughs> there are no known venomous frogs, and because venom is is a subset of of a toxin, which is a subset of a poison, of uh, you know, there are many toxic frogs, that, and like the the um, the dart frogs are a good example. Those mm. you know from South America, which are which are known to to have been used to coat um, a dart. Uh, um, what are they called? The blow the poison darts. The, the blow, blow darts. Yeah, the yeah. poison darts. Um, yeah, not the actual frogs. The toxin from the frogs is That's used right. to they coat don't, it. They don't use frogs <laughs> on the darts. Now I've got but, this. Oh, it's bad. <laughs> That's awesome. That's <laughs> like angry birds, but with frogs. <laughs> it, 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 it'd be like a, the most wriggly quiver of you know, little yeah. darts ever. It's it'd be really hard to those. <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> so, so but because these things, these frogs have got these little spines on their, on their face, um, they they can actually deliver it, so so it's actually an active venom because they can inject it into you. The they thing can... is, though, like the, it wouldn't have gone very. Like, I'm guessing that these spines aren't that no, long, or, or and it obviously didn't hurt that much because so it must have right. just got just under the skin layer, rather yes. than you know. <laughs> and this is where the toxicity is is uh, is quite stunning because these these things are significantly more venomous than a pit viper. God. Um, so, so for example, they um, did some experimentation using the the toxin from these frogs um, with uh, with mice, and they found that a single dose, if you like, uh, of this toxin around around a gram, they said, so a single gram, roughly the same mass of a large paperclip, of this toxic secretion could kill more than three hundred thousand mice, or really? approximately eighty humans. Holy crap! Yeah, that's pretty toxic. <laughs> that's <laughs> so nuts. Says, in other words, this. I mean, I mean, I mean, that's the pure toxin, right? Not the correct. You know, not mixed up yeah. with all the other secretions that come, not, come not with the, the toxin. Not the still. severely sort of cut I'm down. Never and, going and, to a jungle and, ever again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not the really low sort of quality toxin you can buy on the street. That's just the, that's the pure <laughs> stuff. Um, that's the so, good stuff, man. <laughs> don't say um, that. Someone will probably. Use so so that was of the lesser of the of of the. Um, the toxic frogs of the two, because that so basically three hundred thousand mice or, or around eighty humans would be killed by this single gram, but the other frog was twice as potent as as the first frog. So one hundred sixty humans. Right. <laughs> That's some toxic <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and this guy was lucky that he got infected from the weaker one and not the strong one. Though. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. well, what's well, what's the actual do- delivery dose though? Like in this in, from this frog, like how much should we talking here? How much would it like this? And first of all, what would the frog use it on? Would it be would it, would it be other predators right. trying to get and to this it? Is, or? This is part of uh, the the behaviour of the frog that that becomes a, a part of the the story here as well, because these mm. frogs they actually live in fairly um, dry forests, and they uh, part of their survival mechanism is they 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 make these sort of shallow burrows and they put the rest of their body in there and they have their heads. Sort of at the t- at the front of the burrow at the hole as like a plug, and that mm. plug keeps all the all the all the moisture in. So it, you know because they're amphibious, obviously. So it's you know they they need the they need constant water on their skin. So um, they plug themselves in, and then there's only this spiky sort of face that's sticking out. So if any predators come along and try and get at them, um, you know the predators are, are likely to be going at them with their with their mouth. That's you yeah. know how most of the predators are going to. So they they mentioned um, some some dogs and they mentioned snakes and other predators that might try and get to these things. The the thing that they'd use to get to them is their mouth, which is going to be, mm. you know, particularly um, susceptible to these tiny little barbs that could be uh, you know that could deliver s- this uh, toxin. Yeah. The other thing that was interesting is is most frogs, like the those dart frogs, for example, they they actually um, absorb the poison the toxin from insects that they eat so they don't produce it themselves these frogs actually seem to produce this toxin as well so they're wow. unique in in quite a few ways so i love these guys already they're awesome they're pretty awesome aren't they <laughs> so so the I, worst worst case scenario is if these guys 
blowing on a hurricane and smack you in the face. <laughs> yeah, flesh eating fungus is the last <laughs> least of your worries. <laughs> oh, there's a frog stuck to me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't want to alarm you, but there's a frog stuck in your face. <laughs> I, the other thing about this, to me, it also seems to suggest that there's a lot we don't know about frogs. Frogs themselves are fairly not very st- well studied, are they? Well, yeah, I mean, the thing is that frogs are one of those um, species that are, that are rapidly, rapidly disappearing mm. from many... Mm places in the world because they're very, you know, amphibians are very, very susceptible to, to changes in climate. So there are many species of frogs that are, you know, on the endangered list and there are, there are many others that are, are rapidly depleting from their areas. And then, of course, you're on the other end of the scale, you've got things yeah. like cane toads that are just, you know, appearing everywhere. <laughs> I'd kind of like to see one of these guys go up against a cane toad and see what happens. But, <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Two amphibians enter, only one. <laughs> only one. <laughs> but it was, I mean, oh, it was awesome. also interesting, you know, as, as I said at the beginning, that um, it's not just that these frogs, you know, have got this delivery mechanism. It's, it's not just that the frogs create the toxin themselves, but they they clearly try and deliver it. This, these things are they try and headbutt you. Mm. to get this toxin into you. They know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's another thing. Apparently, like, most frogs can't do that sort of headbutting manoeuvre, but they've obviously evolved a method of contorting themselves into a headbutt. That's right, yeah. So they said, you know, um, basically when they restrain these, these frogs, um, the frogs release this sort of sticky secretion from their skins, and at the same time as doing that, they flex, its, they, they flex their heads which is apparently an unusual ability well, for them, ensuring that they're able to jab and rub their venom-coated well, spines. Well, I'm looking at a picture of these frogs, and they, they've got more of a pointy head than most frogs that I've seen anyway. You know, so it almost, like, you know, most frogs, their, their, top, their heads are sort of more connected to their bodies, necks, you know what I mean? Like, whereas this, mm-hmm. it looks like, just looking at the picture anyway, knowing what they can do, you can sort of see how they could possibly move their heads a bit more than most mm. other frogs. And yeah, I hate I to say saying. it, but they kind of, they do look cute. They kind of look cute. <laughs> I don't yeah, want to touch any cute. frog ever now. <laughs> they got big, they got big bulbous eyes and they look, you know, and, you know, they, it's and very that, sad. I think that seems to be the, the primary difference in a frog and a toad. Frogs seem to look cute. Oh God, I don't know what the technical difference is. I but... still, I still don't know the difference between a frog and a toad really. I've been told this many times and I still can't remember, but anyway. Yeah. I don't know either, but uh, for me, uh, this is a bit like uh, Dr. Carl's way of describing the difference in a, a fruit and a vegetable. <laughs> is uh, a fruit is something you put you eat with ice cream. So, <laughs> okay. okay. According to Kid Zone, uh, frogs need to live near water, have smooth, moist skin that makes them look slimy, have a narrow body, have higher, rounder, bulgier eyes, longer hind legs, take long, high jumps, and have many predators. Toads don't need to live near water, have rough, dry, bumpy skin, have a wider body, have lower football-shaped eyes, shorter, less powerful hind legs, will run or take small hops rather than jumps, and don't have many predators. Hmm. I don't know if the lack of predators is really a taxonomic marker, but... (laughs) Yeah, it might just be a bonus to being ugly as sin. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Wow. So, as I said, avoid frogs and avoid jungles. But, uh, <laughs> At all times. <laughs> <laughs> but sticking with the animal world again, this is the creepy, nasty animal show <laughs> this week. Uh, Shane, let's talk about the wasp that zombifies spiders. Yeah, see, zombify. I, I hate wasps and I hate spiders, so I'm really trying to figure out which one I feel more sorry for. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, that's I mean, who, who I'm rooting for. Let's put it that way. Um, so, I'm anti-spider, but somehow a zombie spider doesn't <laughs> sound much better. Uh, no, no. Um, so this is very reminiscent of the, um, paras- the, the parasitic fungi that invade Amazonian ants and turn them into zombies in some ways. Yeah. Um, if you, I think we've done stories on this. Um, if you remember, the fungi um, will infect an ant and it will make the ant climb up to the top of a tree and then burst out of its head and spread its spores over the forest floor. Yeah. And thus the cycle repeats itself. 
really this? good um, Attenborough uh, video clip of that on YouTube. If you search for Attenborough and zombie yeah. ant, I'm guessing you'll find it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what these spiders do is um, something quite similar in some ways, except that it's even it's even more pernicious, I suppose, in some ways. Um, a parasitic wasp will dive bomb a spider. It'll sting the spider. Um, it'll then, while the spider is paralyzed from the venom, it will inject the spider with an egg or it will somehow implant an egg onto it. And then it'll go around. Its the spider will get up and go, oh, that was strange. Fine. It'll start walking. And then eventually the egg will hatch. Larvae will infect the spider and somehow manipulate it into making a stronger web for itself. Um, like the, these spiders okay. will, yeah. So these spiders apparently make it's it's, it's a certain species of spider um, that infects. Oh, a certain it doesn't species. do it on all spiders. No, it infects. A, oh, that's yeah. less cool. Okay. But, <laughs> well, it doesn't surprise me. And I mean, these sorts of evolutionary uh, mechanisms are usually quite specific. Yeah. Don't really know why, but yeah. but anyway. Um, so these spiders will apparently they normally produce two types of web. One is the the web that they use for catching prey. Um, it's much. It's quite circular. It's sticky. It's probably quite um, tightly packed. But there's a second type, which is called a resting web, and that's more like a hammock. It's like like a resting place for the spider, and they use this to molt. Um, okay. Apparently, when these parasitic larvae take over these spiders, and they don't know the mechanism, by the way, they're, they're not even sure how this works. But what what will happen is that the spider will then be forced to spin a web that's like its hammock, but a lot stronger. So it essentially becomes a cocoon for the wasp. And then once it's done that, the spider dies. <laughs> and but it's already made a cocoon for the yeah, wasp but it's made a to pupate. The... Yep. Wow. Yep. Um, yeah. It's, the cre- <laughs> it's one of the creepiest things I've read in a long time. <laughs> it seems an awful lot of effort to go to. It's, very, it's, a, very, it's a very sort of convoluted process. And yet, this is why this is why a lot of these parasitic kind of interactions seem to work. It's very mm. convoluted, and you, and you think, what is there really like if the cost benefit ratio here is is it really that much? But maybe it's one of those things that you know with evolution, it, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just got to work. Yeah. No. So no. maybe it you know it's haphazard and bizarre, but but it gets the job done. And it's also so diabolically evil. It is. <laughs> it reminded me of Have you seen those photos of the of, of spider webs made? By spiders that have been uh, affected under, by various psychotropics and yeah. th- you know like things like LSD no. and caffeine yeah. and stuff like yeah. that. Have a look at them, man. There's a, you know you can find them on the internet pretty easily. And, and spiders completely change the web pattern that they build uh, based on what chemicals they're exposed to. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, so you know there's a whole lot of ones like as I say, even as, as mundane as caffeine affects the spider's <laughs> webs, marijuana, LSD, all Gets these. Gets it done a lot faster. <laughs> <laughs> it's just and it's just the whole time it's got the munchies. But it's um, <laughs> but when it with, with this it said apparently this um, uh, this secretion or this whatever it is 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 very similar to something that the spider itself creates mm. and that's created by its own system. Mm. Um, and it, it, it affects the uh, endocrine system of the spider. Um, and as Shane said, they're not really sure how. But yeah, that's that's the first thing it reminded me of. Is the case well, so obviously chemicals must have you know a fairly key oh yeah you know, role yeah. to play in 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 the spider's you know interpretation of the instructions or but, whatever but, I mean, it is. The, the thing is, the, the series of genes that would govern web building, um, I'm guessing, are fairly complex you know there'd be a lot of like it'd be a very complex system and mm. to manipulate that system on a phenotypic level it must require you know it's it's it'd be a fairly sophisticated chemical here we're, talk, we're talking about so it, you know it, it managed to ma- manipulate this very very complicated system into doing something else entirely and almost well, perfect not built. entirely it's making your normal resting one but stronger and longer it's it's like it's almost like a mixture of the resting and the um, catching web, okay. really. So as far as I can tell, like it's that, you know, you want to really. It has to be really really strong, has to be sort of it has to wrap up and it you know and it's also quite dense. So there's yeah. a passage in uh, the Science Magazine article uh, where uh, evolutionary biologist at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute uh, William Eberhard says that 
he suspects that the larvae inject the molting chemicals into the spider's abdomen, it's just tricking the spider into thinking that it's going to do its molting thing. So it's kind mm. of kickstarting another process that the spider's already programmed to do. They're just flipping certain switches and saying, going to overdrive yep. on this one. Yeah. But it's yeah. just, if you could control <laughs> another species and all you do is say, make me a bed, <laughs> I'm disappointed. <laughs> Make me a, d- a bed, then come over here and die so I can eat shit. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the story of evolution has been how can I best live? How can, you know, what's the best way Survive. I can yeah. Survive. And this is, yeah, pretty good way. <laughs> okay, yeah, I as I said, very convoluted Yeah. And, and almost unnecessarily evil, but it works. <laughs> Clearly it does. Uh, it also shows, I think, the, um, the fragility of ecosystems like this because if you take out one particular spider and suddenly that wasp has no way of making its cocoon and you take out another species as well yes there's a lovely um there's an xkcd comic that's always stuck with me and it talks about an orchid who used to you know it used to pollinate by the action of a bee like you know it's it's stamen looks like a certain kind of bee so a bee would come along and try to mate with it and thus pollinate it and that was its only means of reproduction. But unfortunately, the bee has been extinct for quite a while. So the orchid has sort of resorted to self-pollination. And eventually, mm. that, will, you know, that will be an evolutionary dead end and it will die out. And, th- and I think that is, that's not just a sort of a flight of fancy from the XKCD author. That is actually based in reality because I think there are a few, a few plant species like that. So, mm. yeah. I'm reading it now. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. <laughs> It's very poignant. Yeah. Uh, and I'd also recommend, um, when talking about freaky parasites, uh, Ed Yong's TED Talk about parasites, which we'll have a link to as well, is breathtaking and gives you a whole nother... I'm not sure if respect's the right word for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it is. You respect... I think it's respect. It, it you, you're freaked out, yeah. but you still respect. You still yeah. respect. <laughs> very cool. Um, all right, Lucas, shall we finish up with... Um, bit of a, a hero of mine in some ways, uh, Professor Simon Chapman, who uh, was called in front of the Senate inquiry into wind turbines, mm. which is um, a investigation from our not exactly in favour of renewables government, <laughs> uh, and in particular Senator John Madigan, who's an uh, independent senator from Victoria, who once declared that <laughs> submarines are the spaceships of the ocean. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Kill me. I didn't realise he'd said that. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, um, my God. What he he said that in Parliament <laughs> while challenging uh, his uh, opposite number to uh, wear a grey shirt, pronouncing that he's in favour of Australian jobs and industry. Anyway, that's a completely separate topic. <laughs> but, uh, Lucas, when uh, Professor Simon Chapman was called up, I'm not sure they quite knew what they were getting because he kind of turned on them quite a lot, didn't he? I, I kind of... I, the, his words I interpreted <laughs> as, as the literal... <laughs> the, <laughs> the literal equivalent of a, a Jedi wielding a lightsaber and just... Just slaying everyone. It was awesome. It was, just, it was laced with sarcasm and just just disdain at the questions he was being asked to answer. It was fantastic. So one of the questions was, have you ever visited the home of anyone claiming to be adversely affected by proximity to wind turbines? And if not, why not? His response is, no, I have not visited any such homes. Here's why. There are many people who passionately believe in things that I do not believe in. For example, every week, many thousands use lottery number selection systems in the firm belief that this will increase their chances of winning the lottery. (laughs) 51% of Britons believe in aliens. Majority of the population believe in the supernatural and life after death and whole religions believe in reincarnation. Some people earnestly believe that aircraft chemtrails are chemical sprays used by governments to control populations and that mobile phones and towers and Wi-Fi are deadly. 
I do not need to talk personally to any of these people or visit their homes in order to corroborate the information that I can obtain from a variety of sources which tells me clearly that these beliefs are irrational <laughs> and, in fact, either nonsense or faith-based beliefs. <laughs> drops mic storms off stage. <laughs> I made up the drops mic part. <laughs> it's... It, um, we'll definitely have links to it because there's so many other just zingers that he lets loose with um, because he's he's being pestered by people who believe things that scientific evidence has time and time again proved is nonsense. Yeah. There is no link between wind farms or wind turbines and any health effects unless they fall on you, as Dr. Carl once said. Mm-hmm. Uh and to waste government and taxpayers' money on an inquiry to find out what numerous top scientific bodies, both government-funded and privately funded, have already investigated is redundant and it's essentially it's a witch hunt. But like that's that's all I really this, had to say. <laughs> that's, that's never stopped this government before. before so. Well, no, this is <laughs> a government run by someone who found one wind turbine offensive when he saw it riding his bike on, was it Rottnest Island? One wind turbine. Therefore, all of them are, and they're all dangerous to our health yeah. because they represent a threat to coal, which is our future. Wow, they actually... I'm just reading some of these comments. They actually tried to get him to... Oh, wow. They asked him about the UN to financial- torture... And you know, yes. basically oh. saying that sleep deprivation. Oh, jeez, I can't. No, even I think my on. I think my favourite one. Although I love I love his response about the infrasound generated by walking <laughs> is, is, is louder than what's generated. That was great. But I, I love question thirty eight, which was, are you aware that the yeah. latest wind power development to be announced in Victoria near Ararat is also very close to a large regional Victorian jail? Response. The response. Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> And then and, and, they and, ask. What did they if, uh, do you want to say it, Shane? Oh well, then yeah. They basically they, they then said, "Are you aware that the UN Committee Against Torture had the following to say about sleep deprivation in custody?" Yeah. And they mentioned the fact that yes, um, sleep deprivation is used to break down the will of the detainee, and therefore they're trying to subtly equate the noise from a wind farm to the, to the well-being of these prisoners. <laughs> Oh, dear God, really? (laughs) And Simon Chapman finishes his response, which is a few sentences long, but he says, to try and suggest that the sounds of wind farms are in any way even remotely equivalent is quite disgraceful. (laughs) Hear, hear. I think we all agree Mm -hmm. with that. And it is a further sad indictment on where this country is going with renewable energy. The sad thing Uh, is, though, that I'm not sure this will make much of a difference. (laughs) No. Oh, no, I don't think it will. I think this was always going to be a, a sideshow, a, um, a freak show almost, and it, it's not going to have any major impact on uh, any policies being made. What a happy note to end the show on. <laughs> I just, I kind of feel like the, this, this senator who was, who was asked, you know, the Victorian senator was asking this question. It, when, I, I haven't seen this guy. I don't know what he looks like, this uh, uh, John Madigan. But in my head, he's, he's the... He's the weatherman from the movie The Anchorman. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm mean. talking about? <laughs> guy from The Office. He's Steve Carroll. He, that's, that's him. He's just completely, yeah. He's not quite, um, but he's... Uh, yeah. He's that bit older, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Probably. yeah. I'm not talking about how he physically looks. Just uh, <laughs> no, just his, yeah. <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> I also like um, Beck Haru, who wrote about this for Science Alert, who's a fantastic Australian science writer. Uh, her subtitle to this is, This is Hilarious, Day Equals Made. made. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well. All right. Links to all the stories that we talked about in today's program are on the web at scienceontop.com slash 196. And, of course, you can leave a comment, you can email us, feedback at scienceontop.com or all the social networks. Thanks, Shane and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. No worries. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. We've been out in our paddock 
and he never mentioned this, but when those turbines go around, they create electricity as well. I've had my tele my phone, mobile phone, go on a charge mode in the middle of the paddock, away from everywhere. These things are damn dangerous.